Pull up an igloo for this week's ATV News. A new study is pushing for more information on the health risks of electronic cigarettes. We'll show you why. Are you stressed? Well, this trend might help you relax. We'll show you how a USU professor is helping to keep E. coli out of your restaurant food. It was one for the ages last night in the spectrum, and that was the first en route to breaking a sports cliche record. Sweetheart or heartbreaker, we'll tell you what to expect on Valentine's Day on your seven day forecast. And it's all coming up on ATV News. Welcome to ATV News. I'm Connor Camo. And I'm Brock Danjanovich. Two drivers are okay today after a car crash last night. The, dr the driver of this truck pulled out into the intersection of 900 North and 700 East and T-Bone and flipped another car. The other driver was transported to Logan Regional Hospital for, as a precaution but had no apparent injuries. Police say both drivers are fine and that the driver of the flipped car was wearing her seatbelt. Jason Ree Lopez pleaded guilty to attempted rape and attempted forcible sexual abuse last week. Ree Lopez was a Utah State student and member of the Sigma Chi fraternity when he was charged. Though the prosecution no longer has to go to trial, their work is still not done. What his thinking was or how he ended up doing the things he did, I'm not sure uh, how he got where he got. And that's why we're going to get some additional information about him before sentencing so we can understand uh, this defendant and why he did the things he did. Ree Lopez now faces the possibility of three years to life instead of five years to life on that charge and zero to five years on the charge of forcible sexual abuse. Sentencing is set for the end of March. Popcorn lung is now said to be a possible side effect for electronic cigarette users after a recent study published in December by the Harvard School of Health. Our Taylor Murray shows you how long the vaping community and health professionals are reacting to these claims. I grabbed it and hit it and I was like, oh, this tastes really good. And it just kind of seemed like uh, something that was a little bit better than cigarettes. E-cigarettes have been growing in popularity as an alternative to traditional tobacco, but that doesn't mean they're completely safe. We don't really see a lot of illness directly related to e-cigarettes, um, but we're starting to see more as time goes by. Electronic cigarettes produce an oil-based vapor, not water vapor, which leaves a thick liquid in your lungs. Lung tissue, which is supposed to allow you to get oxygen in and out of your lungs, uh, can become uh, impaired by that. Now a study published by Harvard is stating a chemical called diacetyl found in 31 out of 50 e-cig juices tested can cause popcorn lung. Popcorn lung is... It's a rare disease that's found in people who are around the the uh, butter flavoring for, for microwave popcorn. Personally I'm not too worried about it. Uh, I don't use diacetyl in any of the vape juice that I make just as a precaution. With no distinct conclusion of the link between diacetyl and e-juice and popcorn lung, users don't seem to have any interest in quitting. I probably would never stop um, unless they come out with like definitive evidence. It has not been shown that concentrations of diacetyl and vape juice can be harmful to humans at all. Even with the lack of evidence, Dr. Davis believes e-cig users should still be wary. While they are probably safer than burning tobacco cigarettes, uh, they, they still, I wouldn't classify them as a safe product. Taylor Murray, ATV News. Some people have questioned the Harvard study's accuracy based on their vague description to the process used to measure diacetyl in the juices. Chipotle restaurants are open again after closing all their stores for four hours on Monday. The restaurant train, the restaurant train was uh, training their staff on food handling safety after a breakout of E. coli hit the stores. Here at Utah State, researchers are part of preventing the problem of breakouts like these. Michael Pate is a researcher who focuses, uh, whose focus is on the food safety in agriculture. By using swabs like these, Pate is able to find different kinds of pathogenic bacteria on workers' hands. He says that the farms practice careful hygiene and limit the amount of bacteria that can be found on the hands of its workers. Take tractors, for example. Pate says that if farms use the same equipment for both produce and livestock without proper cleaning, it could spread contamination. 
But with the work he does, Pate can keep harmful food from leaving the farm. If we find a sample that may have contamination or does have contamination, we can trace it back quickly and identify where it's gone and how we can stop it before it reaches someone's plate. He is the longest running political cartoonist in the country. This week, he came to speak at USU. Pat Bagley from the Salt Lake Tribune spoke at the JCOM Department's Morris Media Lecture on Tuesday. During his talk, Bagley spoke about different topics he has covered from politics to the LDS Church. He also spoke about the challenges of being one of the few political cartoonists left in the country. You can find more of Bagley's political cartoons online at www.sltrib.com. Mardi Gras is a Louisiana tradition dating back to 1856. This weekend, the students took part in this tradition, Utah State style. Students filled the Nelson Fieldhouse and Taggart Student Center to participate in the festivities. Those activities included dances in the Fieldhouse and TSC, a mock casino, and pictures with an exotic snake, and henna tattoos. USUSA, which sponsored the event, said the main goal was to have students have fun without things getting too out of control. We have been able to gain a lot of feedback from students that have been to the event in past years, and we know what they like and what they dislike and what they want to see in the future. So with those comments and that feedback, we're able to improve upon and enhance the student experience. The next event sponsored by USUSA will be a poetry and a beverage on February 13th. Coming up, how can something you did as a kid help you relax now? Students competed this weekend to see who has the choice voice. Find out what is next for our Aggie Voice Champion. Students in biological engineering at Utah State University have the unique chance through the Synthetic Biomanufacturing Institute to engineer uses for spider silk. Projects developed in the lab include medical coatings, strong adhesives, and elastic woven fibers. These Aggies from Utah State are influencing and changing the face of biological engineering. Join them and leave your mark as well. A new relaxation fad has made its way to Cache Valley, but it may not be as beneficial as you think. Our Emily Duke is live in the atrium to show you it can still be a lot of fun. Emily? Emily Stringham and her roommate Darby Richens color together. <laughs> My roommate does it with me. It's a lot of fun. It's more fun doing it with someone. Some of these books claim to be relaxing, for stress relief, even meditative. I don't have to worry about anything else. I just sit in color. It's very relaxing to me. The books have become very popular in Cache Valley. Here at Hastings, there's a whole section dedicated just to them. One employee said they add new books every day. One psychologist said drugs are sometimes used to deal with stress and anxiety. Maybe coloring is a better option. If people have found this to be a way to cope with stressful situations and they like it, and that's fantastic, then I think they should, should stick with it. Though he admits that the books may help, Thuig says he's never prescribed coloring. I don't know of them as a therapeutic technique. There's also no scientific research to back up the book's claims of relaxation. As a psychologist dealing with anxiety disorders, coloring books wouldn't be the first thing I'd suggest, but there's certainly nothing wrong with them. With or without scientific evidence, these two friends will continue to use this as a creative outlet. I would tell haters that they should probably try it before they knock it out for 100% saying that it's lame, but to each their own. It works for me, but I could understand why it doesn't work necessarily for everybody else. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. You have, you have the chance to see artwork from around the country made by 50 USU alumni. ATV's Natalie Humphreys takes us from the studio to the museum.
This lump of clay will soon become a work of art. Current students are practicing their skills in the USU Ceramics Studio. Basic stuff, like I don't remember really learning a lot of different techniques or anything. But like when I saw it in college, like that was when I was just like mesmerized by like the clay and just everything about it. So I'm just kind of like still learning from everyone around me, seeing like what they've done and what they're doing. After students finish their project in the studio, they bring it out here to be fired. Then they take it back in the studio to be glazed and bring it out here for a second firing. That's the final product that we will see in the Nora Eccles Museum. And on behalf of the museum, I welcome you to the opening reception for Vision and Persistence, 30 years of ceramic excellence at USU. I think that this is a diverse enough group of pieces to demonstrate definitively that USU doesn't have a style, but there has been a tradition of valuing craftsmanship. If you go back in the ceramic studio, you see kilns that were built by students. You see mixers that were built by students. Ceramic students don't just learn how to throw, but how to mix their clay, make glazes, and fire kilns. Yeah, I, I just get lost in it, in like a good way. Like the deeper I get into it, like the more I realize like there's so much to it. Natalie Humphreys, ATV News. The exhibition is in the museum until March 2nd. Last Friday, 10 Aggies got the chance to show USU what they've got. The contestants were the judges' picks for top 10, but at Aggie Voice, the audience chose their top singer via their cell phone. By the end of the night, the 10 were reduced down to 3, and the 3 down to 1. Anna Pesci Kaili beat the, other, beat the top 3 candidates with Jennifer Hudson's And I'm Telling You. She won recording time with a record producer in Cache Valley, as well as $500 and two tickets onward to the voice competition in LA. And the other finalists took their loss in stride. I was actually just sad it was over, the whole process was over, uh, just because I think we all had grown so close. Um, but I think it was, it was fair, I think it was awesome, and I was very happy to be a part of it. According to Christian, the finalists became such close friends they're planning on going out to lunch next weekend. They might even form their own singing group. Ooh, I wonder how that will go. When we come back, he's David Matthew Stewart, we'll have your Cash Valley weather report. The current temperature in Logan is 24 degrees. Sorry, I've got big ideas. As a college student, you have big ideas to make a big difference on campus. Why not get funding for those ideas in a big way? The Blue Goes Green Grant provides funding for student sustainability projects. These projects help USU students be more environmentally responsible, live healthier, and save money. To find out more, go to usu.edu slash bgg. Get funding for your Blue Goes Green idea in a big way. Blue Goes Green. Aggie Air is an innovative engineering program exclusive to Utah State. It provides opportunities for students to get hands-on and real-world experiences. By building model planes that photograph and scan detailed images of landscapes, Aggie Air can change the way we use the Earth's surface. Watch as Aggie Air takes flight. All right, welcome back. Now, it, let's just hop on into the national radar. I want to show you something. We've got this area of storm up here in the corner. You'll see over Washington. But over Utah, there's not a lot going on. But if you look out the window, you're going to see something going on. It looks a lot like a uh, split piece sweep out there. That's because we've got an area of high pressure just sitting over Utah. This whole area right here, it's clear because the area, the area around it has kind of a bowl over it. And that bowl isn't going to go anywhere for a couple of weeks. No, just days, sorry. If we can hop on over to the seven day, We've got the seven day forecast, when it, when, you, when, it, when it pops up, we're going to see that the last couple of days have been uh, kind of hazy, today's going to be kind of hazy, there we are. We've got some haze, and so the inversion is not going anywhere uh, for a couple of days until that storm, which I showed you just up over uh, the Pacific area, Pacific Northwest, comes on down and pushes the storm, the inversion out. Um, that'll be around Saturday with 20%. We've got a 20% chance of actual rain, but the, the front's going to keep pushing, pushing it on through. Sunday, Valentine's Day, we're going to hopefully get some snow. Monday, we're going to get a little bit more rain. And then by Tuesday, the storm will have hopefully pushed stuff through and we'll have some clear air. Hopefully, uh, that's what we get going for you. Often, that doesn't work out. But let's toss it on back to the desk with Brock and Connor, and we'll talk about sports.
Thanks, David. And before we head over to sports, if you think football season is over, think again. That's right, Brock. Off-season training is the start of a new season. Our Tory Green talked to the team to show you how important it is. Things are moving as USU football players train in the weight room. In the off-season, instead of pushing opponents, they push iron. Weight training is really important for football players, especially this time of year. It sets the foundation for everything that we're going to do. That foundation is building strength and speed and conditioning. It's really important to build the foundation, not just from uh, training and uh, like a body standpoint, but the culture. And that culture starts with being on time, being early, accountability. Um, you know, that's kind of what we're setting right now in this off-season period. Coaches say the importance of weight training and conditioning in the offseason is not just to grind, but to prepare for the season. We're getting great players who are great at the game of football, but we've got to get bigger, we've got to get stronger, we've got to get faster, we've got to do all those things and build up the physical side of it to get guys ready to compete at a high level. Some people may think football begins in August. The offseason is huge. The offseason is key. I mean, you don't just wake up. August 1st coming into camp and hope for the best. And also, it's a continual process. The reality is, is everyone in this league is getting coached hard. Everybody is training hard. Football players spend most of their off season lifting weights and working out. But what happens when they stop doing this? The point of training is to not just burn out a player. We don't want to quote unquote kill anybody. I mean, we want to work guys. We want guys to find a way to dig deeper than they've ever dug before to get better than they've ever been before. But they also spend a lot of time recovering. The recovery is almost more important at that part than the training because if you're doing it for eight hours a week, I mean, how many other hours is that that you could derail the process? If you don't make time for recovery, not only can it affect you physically, but it can affect you mentally as well. How do we not neurologically fatigue and get a guy so burnt from both ends of the candle that he can't compete anymore because then you start running the risk of getting injured. The injury is a real aspect of the game. So for the player's sake, the off-season programs are vital. It gives me time you know, to get stronger, faster, and recover from in-season injuries. It's important as a player because the reality is you only get one shot at it. Tory Green, ATV News. Man, I didn't know they had a long off season. That's some hard work right there. It's a lot harder work than me. My, my uh, work consists ba basically of Netflix. Uh, but speaking of the off season, isn't a lot going on in the in season right now, Jeff? There sure is, Brock. Coming up, we're going to have a lot of sports for you, and we're also going to break a record for uh, cliches. But men's tennis stayed hot while men's basketball regrouped. We're going to show you all that and more after the break. At the Utah State Journalism Department, we can't offer you a cool press hat. We can't offer you a spot on a blooper reel. We can't offer you easy A's. We can't offer you time off. We can't offer you ridiculously dramatic music playing in the background, or even my British voice. What we can offer you is an education that leads to a job that makes a real difference. Are you frustrated with your major? I'm done. Do you wish your professor This week on ATV, we're breaking the student newscast you record for sports cliches. So we have this bell, and Connor here is going to ring it every time that I use a cliche, and we're going to give you guys a grand total at the end. Sound good, guys? I'll take that as a yes. All right, we're going to start with women's tennis, which was in action against number 69 Denver on Sunday. The Aggies would have, would have their work cut out for them against the Pioneers, however, and they left it all on the court with points like these from Nini Gunzler. But she would ultimately fall short. Katarina Turganova tried to turn it up a notch with points like this, and Monica Van de Vondel tried to keep up the tempo as well. But, but they would both run out of answers for, De for Denver. Though the game was closer than the final score would indicate, the Aggies ultimately, field, ultimately fell to the Pioneers. USU will be at home against Iowa State on Friday. True excited to have that opportunity to see how well we can do against a team like that. Um, they always do well in their conference and so uh, if we can do well against them we can play well against any Mountain West team. We'll stay on the court where the men's tennis team has been red hot. 
The Aggies went into Friday's match against Southern Utah, riding a three-game winning streak. They stayed hungry, though, thanks to rallies like this from Jaime Barajas, who won his match two sets to none, and from Samuel Serrano, who got a bit cheeky with his shots en route to a two-set to none victory. Luis Lopez also got in on the action with hits like this that went unreturned. The Aggies would overpower the Thunderbirds 7-0 while only losing three total games in singles play. USU wouldn't have to wait long to play again as they turned around to play Montana State the same day. Barajas and Serrano set the tone with a, with a killer instinct in doubles, winning 6-1. Serrano would continue his dominance with rallies like this and was backed up by his teammate Swindles with long rallies like this. The Aggies had a clean sweep on the day and will try to carry that momentum through the week when they take on number 71 South Alabama at home. I think it's a great opportunity for us. It's our first ranked team at home of the year and gives us a good opportunity to get back into the rankings. It's definitely an advantage playing here in Logan. The Aggies are 6-3 and three overall and still undefeated at home this season in four games. Now we'll switch to the hardwood where the women's basketball team took on two conference opponents this week. They started on Wednesday against Boise State with a two-game winning streak on the line. Three Aggies scored in double digits. Rachel Brewster had 12, including this jumper. Katie Toole had 14, including this shot. And Funda Nagasoglu was an offensive juggernaut, scoring 19 points and leading all scorers. However, that was still behind her season and conference leading average of 21 points per game. Nagasoglu did it all for the Aggies, playing 40 minutes of the game and bringing in three steals and three assists. Neither team could buy a basket, however, as the Aggies shot just 35% from the field and the Broncos were even colder, shooting only 33%. However, it still wasn't enough for the Aggies as the Broncos got shots from behind the arc and, and in the paint and would go on to beat the Aggies by a final score of 63-58. to Head coach Jerry Finkbeiner said that the team just needs to find its swagger. In a nutshell, that was it. It's just, we're pretty good, but we don't know it yet. And that's hard to coach. Um, I just told the girls in the locker right now is that, you know, that very statement right there, and we just got to come back another day. Utah State looked to bounce back on Saturday against Wyoming. It was the Nagasoglu show, again, as she put on a clinic and ran up 32 points against the Cowgirls. She was also a perfect 12 for 12 from the charity stripe. But the Cowgirls were sharpshooters from three-point land and made 13 of 38 attempts from beyond the arc like these. The Aggies would dig in and muscle out an 84-75 an to, an to 75 victory to improve to 11-11 on the season. And for Nagasaglu, the point explosion was a much-needed boost. For myself, I wanted to play well. For the team, I wanted to play well because I knew if I wasn't personally executing, then there wasn't much going on in the team as well because of the leadership role I have. Utah State is in action tonight against New Mexico in Albuquerque. The Aggies' 19-point the Aggies loss to Wyoming this weekend took their losing skid to five games. They were trying to put all of that behind them last night as they took on New Mexico in the spectrum. Things were going, things were going for the Aggies early, as even their misses, like this free throw, were converted into three-pointers like that. That was Lou Evans, who had a stellar game with 15 points. However, it was Chris Smith who led the team in scoring with shots like this three-pointer, which he got nothing but net. Smith ended up with 19 points in the game. But it wasn't all one-sided though, as New Mexico shot 45% from the field and at times, like right here, even kept the bank open late. However, the Aggies made more plays. Like right here, where Shane Rector picked a, picked a Lobo's pocket and takes it coast to coast for the slam jamma The Aggies broke their losing streak and beat New Mexico 80-72. to And Coach Durier hopes that this win will lead to others. One win can become two, and two can become three, and, and that's kind of the way you got to look at it. It's contagious either way. So. Hopefully we'll, we'll have some more good nights. USU's next game is February 17th in Logan. So how do we do, guys? Well, Jeff, I counted 47 cliches. Okay. Well, that's better than I expected, but I'm excited. That, that will always be a record in my book. <laughs> Thanks, Connor. <laughs> Coming up, how cat lovers are making everyone happy. And this is your last weekend to go ice skating outside in Logan. We will show you where to go. Coming up. Thanks for calling the GED Pep Talk Center. Jerry Stiller speaking. Your level seven in your face pep talk. I can keep pushing you. Believe me, I'm good at it. But at some point, you're going to need to start pushing yourself. See, once you've got your GED diploma, 
You, you'll feel so good about yourself. You tell them. You can't change your past, but you can definitely change your future. That makes me so happy, I'm ready to bust out a dance. Mr. Trejo, can I transfer this guy to you? My gentle technique isn't really working. You need something a little more... Persuasive? Yes! You listen, and you listen good. Hey, where's my sandwich? Terry? Terry! Take it from me to King DMC. It's a real cool thing to get your GED. Get that diploma! Now hold on and we'll find you three GED classes. Capiche? Whatever motivation you need, we've got a pep talk for you. Get your GED pep talk and find free classes at yourged.org. Feral cat populations at USU are under control because of Aggie cats. The 10-year-old program keeps three cat colonies on campus, and they do it with just volunteers and donations. Feeding the kitties. <laughs> is what Larry Gardner has been doing every day for more than five years. Gardner scoops and gives food as a volunteer for Aggie cats. We're really just maintaining feeding stations and very rarely do we even have to trap and spay or neuter any cats anymore. But initially they were doing more than just spaying and neutering. The former method was trap and kill. But even if you don't like cats, you don't necessarily like killing them. So they switched to trap, neuter, release. It actually controls the wild populations, um, keeps the numbers down so that the people who don't like the cats don't have problems. But the program also has safeguards for the cats. Aggie Cats doesn't disclose the exact location of the colonies because it wants to make sure that the cats are safe. It also makes sure that there are fences in front of the feeding stations so that no unwanted visitors get in. And that includes other cats. He sits there and protects and those other ones now won't be, won't be able to come in. They'll be afraid of him. But with feral cats, it's sometimes just a matter of getting reused to humans. When we first started doing this, they were all, you couldn't even get hardly close to them. Now they all come running out to say hello. So it's pretty neat to see these guys. But it's actually the humans who have started this whole problem. We're responsible for the uh, feral cat population being so out of control. So I think we need to face, face that and take responsibility for it and, and, and take care of it in a humane and effective way. Sarah Winder, ATV News. Aggie Cats has spayed and neutered about 80 cats, and based on cat birth rates, they have prevented the birth of over 9,000 kittens. If you want to ice skate outside in Logan this winter, you better do it soon. Merlin Olin, I, Mer, Merlin Olson Ice Skating Rink is closing this weekend. These happy people can only skate here until President's Day. Logan Parks and Rec says the rink will close because of unpredictable weather conditions and the crews need to get ready for spring. We wanted to give the public as much time as we thought we could give uh, without taking away from their preparation time for um, spring and summer. Parks and Rec is renovating the southeast corner of the park and is planning on using the concrete area as a second rink next winter. Thank so Brock, what do you think of all that inversion outside as David mentioned earlier? It's filthy, filthy, but I might be going to that ice skating rink anyways. It just sounds worth it and with I a couple days left. I have no idea how to ice skate. Oh, you'll get there someday. Hopefully. Thank you for joining us on this edition of ATV News. Catch all of our latest shows on our Facebook page. See you next week. Are you frustrated with your major? I'm done. Do you wish your professors were more available to you? Do you wish your dreams of appearing on television would come true? 
we have the solution for you. Broadcast journalism offers hands-on experience, one-on-one assistance, and the opportunity to work with ATV News. Join the JCOM family today.